we're not individuals in a developmental sense because bacteria are involved in all of these different kinds of systems. Things like obesity, uh, et cetera, are, are controlled by, by, by your microbiota. So how about immune individuality? You know, we think of our, our immune system as defending us. But in reality, the hollow bio perspective is that your immune system is really much more like passport control or a bouncer. Uh, it knows who to let in and who not to let in. And in fact, the interesting thing about the immune system is that unlike the old idea, this idea of defense, it actually helps establish microbiota in your body. So here we have three different papers. These results underscore the adaptive immune system's critical role in establishing a sustainable host microbial relationship. This may involve the creation of an optimal symbiotic environment on the interior of the Peyer's patches. These are um, areas in, in your gut that are uh, colonized. Therefore, the commensal bacteria exploit the toll-like receptor pathway to actively suppress immunity. We propose that the immune system can discriminate between pathogens and the microbiota through the recognition of symbiotic bacterial molecules in a process that engenders commensal colonization. Physiologic individuality. This is a little um, mealybug, Planococcus, and uh, one of the metabolites it needs is phenylalanine, and the phenylalanine is not produced by Planococcus, and it's not even produced by Tremblia, which is a symbiont, bacteria symbiont of Planococcus. It's actually produced uh, by all three, the symbiont of the symbiont of Planococcus. Here's the path of it being produced. It starts off in the symbiont, goes into the symbiont of the symbiont, back to the symbiont, and then finally into the mealy bug to uh, be turned into phenylalanine. So as much as one-third of an animal's metabolome, uh, the diversity of molecules carried in its blood, has a microbial origin. Thus, the circulatory system extends the chemical impact of the microbiota throughout the body. This is a um, diagram from the McFall Nye paper showing the reciprocal nature of the bacterial interaction with all of these different systems of the body that actively maintain physiological homeostasis. It is not just a relationship between mother and child. It's a relationship between mother, child, and symbionts. Mother's milk contains oligosaccharides that babies cannot digest because they're not for the infant. They're there as natural prebiotics to feed the bifidobacterium species that the infant will need in its intestines. Uh, here's an example of speciation due to cytoplasmic incompatibility. Uh, Wolbachia bacteria, again, will uh, infect various animals and they can actually either change the sex of the animal, change the sexual uh, or the mating preferences of the animal, or they can change the uh, animal so that it actually can only produce viable offspring with another infected animal infected with, in fact, the same strain of Wolbachia, not a different strain. So here's an example of reproductive isolation, the idea that you had to have a, a certain kind of geography or, or that sort of thing being induced by the microbiota. And in fact, there's even this idea that's come along now that perhaps the whole idea of animal multicellularity may, in fact, be a symbiotic phenomenon. Uh, here's a little coanoflagellate uh, protist over on that side, swimming along all by itself. But when it is cultured with agorophagus uh, bacteria, it changes its living habit and grows in a colonial form. So uh, even perhaps the, the, the development of animal multicellularity is in fact uh, a phenomenon that may be due to symbiosis with microbiota. 
So here's the hollow biont uh, perspective. Animals are not biological individuals. In anatomical individuality, nine out of 10 of our cells is microbial. Physiologic individuality, the joined metabolic pathways have a collective purpose and defense. Developmental individuality, our gut microbes help build the gut, the immune system, the light organ in the squid, prevent ovarian cell death in the wasp. Uh, immune individuality, microbes help build the immune system, they expand the lymphocyte repertoire. Microbes become self, they're a bouncer, not an army. Genetic individuality, the genome involved with those of symbionts, over 100 different genomes, many have phenotypic outcomes. And evolutionary individuality, symbionts can provide selectable variation and reproductive isolation. So the message is that we aren't individuals, we are teams or communities uh, with these kinds of properties. And is this being accepted? Yes. This is the cover of the January Science News Magazine. Although I would say that they have it a little bit wrong, microbes have not infiltrated multicellular life. They invented animal multicellularity and they're still part of animals. But I want to talk just now about uh, a new view of evolution. Most of evolution and evolutionary theory took place in what was called the geological idea of evolution, which was essentially that geology and biology were very separate. But there was a different track where people realized that there was a coevolution of the planet and the biota. So it's a reciprocal process that for at least 3,800 million years has um, had the biota changing the environment and then the changed environment forcing the biota to change some more. Uh, this idea um, shows up in the works like uh, Lawrence Henderson, who is a Harvard uh, physiologist. His book, The Fitness of the Environment, sort of a bookend to the Darwinian notion of being fit for the environment. Um, the Russian Vernadsky, who is the author of The Biosphere, uh, he is famous for saying that life is a geological force, um, that life saturates the crust of the earth, and life penetrates life. And James Lovelock, who uh, in 1970, while he was working on the NASA Viking mission to Mars, came up with the Gaia hypothesis. He had been hired by NASA to invent uh, instruments. It seems that he was in a meeting um, where they were discussing life detection experiments and uh, Lovelock didn't agree with the, the ideas that were being proposed which to him all sounded like they expected life on Mars to be an awful lot like Earth life. He brought up this objection that you, one could not assume that Martian life would be anything like Earth life. And so he was challenged, okay, Jim, you're so smart, come up with a life detection experiment for life that isn't like Earth life. And uh, what he thought of was the fact that if there was any kind of life, it would have to use the fluid media on the planet, the hydrosphere and the atmosphere. Mars doesn't have much of a hydrosphere at all. Um, so it would have to use the atmosphere to collect the materials uh, and energy for, for its life processes as metabolism and it would have to use the same uh, fluid media to dump its wastes. And that this would throw the atmosphere of Mars out of chemical equilibrium. And actually he realized that he had discovered life on Earth because the Earth, unlike Mars and Venus, and it's not just a Goldilocks kind of thing, it's not just that it's too hot, too cold, and just right, if you extrapolate between Mars and Venus, you do not get Earth. Earth is very much unlike what it should be. Uh, you'll notice that, for instance, we have a, a predominantly nitrogen atmosphere, unlike Mars or Venus, both of which have essentially a CO2 atmosphere. And we also have this enormous amount of oxygen, 
which is a highly reactive gas. It basically reacts with most everything and has to be constantly replenished along with other things like methane. Um, so we're very anomalous, and all of these anomalies are essentially explained by life. Cyanobacteria created the oxygen in our atmosphere, and uh, the microbiota and the protists basically have sequestered most of the carbon dioxide, uh, until we came along, uh, in the oceans in the form of uh, limestone and marble. Gaia is uh, sometimes, um, well, it was very much dissed because it came along around the same time that those sorts of new age things became popular. And Lovelock did make the mistake of using the idea of Earth as a superorganism as a metaphor. He collaborated with Lynn Margulis on the theory. She provided a lot of the mostly microbial underpinnings of Gaia theory. Ever since life appeared on Earth, it has essentially been microbial. It's a microbial world we're just sort of visiting. And along with this idea of Gaia, we get a really new uh, idea of the gene. The gene is really not something that does anything by itself. Uh, DNA really does nothing. It's a part of a system, and every part of a system is required, and none is privileged. So. It's really just part of a dynamic organelle in the cellular system. The DNA does encode proteins, that's true, but it also does lots of other things. I believe that something like 80% of the, what was called junk DNA, because it didn't make proteins, has now been identified as having either structural or instructional uses in the genome to tell the genome how to rearrange itself and the genome actually does rearrange itself in relation to the environment. So it's, it's, it's is not this idea of a static uh, sanctuary. It is actually a, a dynamic organelle of the cell. Let's just look at what the Gaia theory actually says. It does not say that the Earth is a superorganism. It says that over 30 million types of extant, that means existing today, organisms descendant from common ancestors and embedded in the biosphere that directly and indirectly interact with one another and with the environment's chemical constituents form a biotic planetary regulatory system. They produce and remove gases, ions, metals, and organic compounds through their metabolism, growth, and reproduction. And these interactions in aqueous solution, mostly water, uh, led to the modulation of Earth's surface temperature, acidity, alkalinity, the pH, and the chemically reactive gases of the atmosphere and hydrosphere. One of the other things that um, Gaia addresses is what's called the faint young sun paradox. The fact that over geologic time, the sun is estimated to have gotten 25 to 30% hotter, but there's been no corresponding temperature increase on Earth. It's true that the Earth has gone through periods that are hotter and colder, it has fluctuations, but it's never gotten so hot that water boiled away, and it's never gotten so cold that the Earth froze solid, even during what's called snowball Earth events, these you know, glaciation events that even had ice at the uh, equator. So you will notice how compatible Gaia is with the new symbiotic biology. The Earth system is self-organized. People said, well, how can, you know, the plants and animals aren't getting together and, and deciding to regulate the planet. How can that work? And uh, in answer to that, Lovelock came up with some computer models called Daisy World that basically showed how a single species in, the, in his model, it was a daisy that grew either black or white, could actually control the albedo and there, therefore the temperature of the planet black would heat the atmosphere so when the earth was very uh, cold mostly you'd have black daisies and as it progressively got uh, warmer you'd have a larger and larger population of white daisies that uh, ratio would work out in such a way that it would regulate the planet one of the things that the McFall Nye paper and the other papers talk about is the fact that these communities from individual communities 
Uh, the eukaryotic cell is sort of an integrated community that all of these things live not in isolation but within larger communities that continually step up. So you have this idea of nested communities going from microbial to planetary in scale, from niche to ecosystem to biome to Gaia, the Earth system. It operates within physical limits, obviously. When the sun gets hot enough, we're all going to be toast because no matter what the, the uh, biota does, it won't be able to, to always regulate the planet. It's a, what's called a homeoretic cybernetic system. It basically has set points, unlike your thermostat, where you set a point and it regulates around that set point. If you have a programmable thermostat, you have a homeoretic thermostat that actually the point around which the temperature is regulated actually moves. So the Earth is homeoretic, and cybernetic just means that it works by way of feedback loops, negative feedback loops for the most part that the essential organisms are the primary producers and recyclers, and that is by and large the prokaryotes, the bacteria, the archaea, and for the eukaryotes, fungi. And one of the things about systems is that they're more than the sum of their parts. They have what are called emergent properties. And I will give you an example. If you take, uh, if you go to a parts department, you buy all the parts for a car, uh, you have the parts for a car, but if you put it together into a car, you have an emergent property, which is transportation. So the car becomes more than the sum of its parts. Gaia, the emergent properties include some of the following. First, the Earth's physiology, this ability to regulate those things, the temperature, the pH. An emergent property is life itself and along with life, the various forms of death, natural selection, you know, death from old age, and even extinction events seem to be cyclical and be part of the system. One of the things that some people have said is that if life really regulated the planet for the benefit of life, there wouldn't, that life would produce the things that it needs so that there wouldn't be any death. But of course, the problem is that the planet can't support all of the progeny of even one species. Uh, for instance, there are bacteria that divide every 15 minutes, and in 36 hours they would engulf the planet if there was enough nutrients, etc., to support them. So death is essentially a natural part of life, and it's required for the system to work. Systems like Gaia also has these cycles. It complexifies, it promotes specialization and colonization. Uh, part of this complexification is to develop new traits and things that allow the biosphere to expand so that we find organisms that can live, uh, particularly microorganisms that can live at all of the extremes, pressure, temperature, etc. Unlike the notion of survival of the fittest, this idea takes into consideration the fact that to become fit for the environment you must specialize, but that the flip side of specialization is fragility, so that when the environment is perturbed, you may be the, the organism that's out of luck. So uh, it's not always the survival of the fittest. Sometimes when the environment is per perturbed, it's the survival of the generalist, actually, that, that happens. And one of the other emergent properties is the fact that uh, the Earth does a lot of recycling of energy and matter. Or as Lynn used to say, Gaia is symbiosis seen from space. And I'll just put up a couple slides to compare the modern synthesis view with Gaian theory view. And uh, if you compare these key words, these are, these are radical shifts in the way that we view the world. The modern synthesis has a very anthropocentric kind of view. Uh, Gaia theory, it's a very biospheric view. It's really a view of what's important for the biosphere. In the selfish gene view, DNA is privileged. But without the cell or a larger system, DNA does nothing. 
the model used for the modern synthesis is zoological. For Gaia, it's microbial. The importance is all on the individual. Gaia theory and the new symbiotic biology basically say there aren't any individuals. It's all communities all the way down. Competition, which is so important to the modern synthetic view of evolution, really talking about colonization and collaboration. Not that there isn't competition, but that it's a competition like you would have in a basketball game. There's a certain, there's a certain amount of rules that are required. Population systems, tree models, these bifurcating trees, networks that things not only divide and diverge, but that distant branches also merge or anastomose. The modern synthesis and population genetics are statistical in contrast to the new symbiotic biology, which is empirical. The modern synthesis considers only the last 542 million years, the Phanerozoic eon from the Cambrian to the present. This is roughly how long animals have been around, but it leaves out more than 80% of the story of life on Earth. The new view of evolution takes in all of deep time and acknowledges that the Precambrian is when most of the important milestones in evolution occurred. The modern synthesis is based in chance and random events where the odds are incredibly long. The new view of evolution recognizes that there is self-organization at all scales and that incorporating genes or genomes that already have useful functions is the rule, not the exception in nature. This is how nucleated cells originated, how aerobic respiration originated, and how photosynthesis was incorporated to form algae and then plants. Neo-Darwinists think in terms of hierarchies with DNA in charge of the body. The new synthetic biology and Gaia theory look at systems of systems, the holarchical structure of nature. The modern synthesis is adamant about organisms developing gradually within a single lineage. The new symbiotic biology recognizes that we are the product of multiple lineages and that we are composites, or chimeras, or holobionts. The modern synthesis insists that evolution is gradual but symbiogenesis can incorporate a genome in a swallow, forming a new holobiont by saltation, a jump with no intermediate steps. Lynn Margulis used to say that the neo-Darwinists had taken the life out of biology, by which I think she meant that they, had, they tended to have a very static view that did not give enough weight to the fact that life is a verb, a process. Life is temporal and dynamic, and that static labels often fool those who use them into thinking they understand something when they only understand a moment in time. One of the remarks from the audience at Scott Gilbert's talk was to question how much we learn from studying organisms in isolation if they are so dependent upon communities in which they reside. What a radical shift in perspective to go from big like us to germs are us. Dawkins and Jerry Coyne and others have a religious certainty about their view of evolution because they think in dichotomies where there is one right answer. But nature appears to be organized in continua where there are many right answers. M most of us subscribe to the notion that nature is about survival of the fittest. But to be fit for an environment means that you have to specialize and specialization can be an Achilles heel when the environment changes. Perhaps the most important difference between these two radically different perspectives is that the new symbiotic biology and this new view of evolution complete the Copernican revolution where we find that not only are we not the center of the universe, but we're not even special or central or necessary to the biosphere. This is a quote from Myra Hurd in uh, a paper. This is uh, how the new view of evolution and the new symbiotic biology might affect social science. Uh, 
I want to close with just a few examples of things that were informed by the modern synthesis and ask you to think about the radically different spin that the new view of evolution puts on each. In a functioning free market, everyone knows that more efficient hospitals would be likelier to survive. We don't have survival of the fittest. In fact, hospitals with more endowment, uh, wealthier hospitals, are more likely to survive. And some people call that survival of the fattest. Survival of the fattest ones are often university-connected or in a major capital city, for instance? Well, they're often large teaching hospitals. I hear all this, you know, well, this is class warfare, this is whatever. No. There is nobody in this country who got rich on his own. Nobody. You built a factory out there, good for you. But I want to be clear, you moved your goods to market on the roads the rest of us paid for. There is a risk. Someone could be the first in the group to get the pot and never come back. But Carlos Vélez Ibáñez, an anthropologist at Arizona State who wrote a book about tandas, he says that's pretty rare. In the United States, there's such stress given to individuality and to individuation and to individual success. Bottom line is trust. They can't believe people trust each other. Vélez Ibáñez says newly arrived Mexican immigrants have to trust each other for survival. Your neighbors, your coworkers are also your mechanics, seamstresses, babysitters, and interpreters. He says these social connections are critical, especially if you're undocumented and can't speak English. When you participate in a, in a rotating savings and credit association, everybody already knows your name. Everybody knows what your social collateral is already, whether you're trustworthy or not.